So yep. let's call this meeting to order. Um, I don't know who all is going to be here, but I think we have a lively discussion. So, so we have lots to talk about. Uh, so this is, I'll call the, the uh, select board, uh, Conway Select Board to order Monday, August 17th, 6 p.m. Zoom. And, uh, and I hope people can join or they can dial in. Um, so we have two minutes, two, two minutes of previous meetings to approve. So the first one uh, was the August 3rd meeting. That was two weeks ago. We talked about things like approving the South River MVP. We talked about the Ashfield Dam. Um, we uh, Bob? About, yep. Bob? Yep. The minutes yep. I, I sent out on Thursday were not complete. Um, un, unfortunately, um, I, I did just send some out, but I, I doubt anybody's had actually any time to look at them. So uh, we should probably table those. Okay, so we'll table that. Uh, I looked at them, they look good. But anyway, uh, I'll table them and we'll oh. do them next week. Okay, and then the uh, second set of minutes we had was the very short little meeting we had on August 7th where we, we met jointly with the assessors and we signed the, uh, the preliminary tax uh, rate. And, um, and that was all we did. So, so did you, Phil, did you read them? Are they okay? Um, I didn't read that, but that was the shortest meeting that we've ever done. And I'm sure the minutes can't be overly complex. Um, they were not. So, I mean, that, that was like a 60 second meeting. Um, no, 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 no. We actually then remember you went down to the, the assessor's office and we had the meeting through your phone. And, right. But the, right. Walk, the walk down to the assessor's office was longer than the <laughs> meeting at the assessor's office. Okay. Uh, yes, that's true. So um, I, I, without seeing them, just knowing that they, it was a single issue meeting and that it was not a complex issue. Yeah. Um, yep. It was a, a real obvious decision. That uh, needed and the minutes just confirmed that we, as a board, approved right. the tax rate. So, so that's I'm it. fine approving them. Okay, so uh, so will you second my my motion to approve yes. them? Yes. And I'll say aye. You yes. say aye. So we'll approve yes. them. And now we have, we have. Uh, can, can I ask who uh, who was calling on on the phone number two two four one? Oh, that's Lisa. Oh, hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. I'll, I'll, re, I'll rename you. Should have recognized that. So we have four warrants that we need to approve. Uh, the vendor warrant for 128900 a payroll warrant for 93666 a payroll deduction warrant for 22690 and a student activity warrant for 6096 so did you take a look at those? They okay? Yeah, they're uh, great. So, so I would make a motion that we approve those warrants. Yes, I I repeat them. They're good. So you got to say second, Phil. Second. Okay. Okay. So we all we both say I now. Yes. So we'll approve those. Um, meetings attended by select board members. Yeah. You're up, Phil. Sorry. Yeah. So um, last week I had a meeting school related meeting almost uh, Monday through Friday, except for the one concom meeting. Um, the week before that uh, meetings, Monday through Friday. Um, and this, this, this is not the time that you want your friends to be on school committee if you really like your friends because um, that you know, and, and uh, it, it, it's it's unseemly to even complain about the hours and the fact that you know you're making a life and death decision and you did not sign up to make life and death decisions like but but the, you know but you can't even do that because the anxiety and the stress everything is understandable and the way you know you're in a democracy and it's like your decision and um, but we've had these school committee meetings Bob that were 250 people on zoom 300 people <laughs> Um, where the public comment period is lasting for three, three and a half hours, where, where the meeting lasts four, four and a half hours. And, um, you know, and, and even though the governor's little fancy color charts that he put out yesterday or the day before 
indicates that we should be looking at a full in-person schooling. Um, that was never at all considered. Um, but and so the, you know the issues were hybrid versus all online, and the depth of passion and reasonableness of arguments on both sides. And it, you, to, to be in a room and to be the one making the decision where you know half the people. I mean, it was it was close. The, there's a definite dip, majority of parents wanted a hybrid opening. Majority of teachers wanted all online. Um, and this is all of the grammar school. Or no, it was also both. At the high so school. it was both. It, see, yeah. I have I have the fortune of being in uh, both here. I realize, and, yes. And you can 38, and so uh, um, in our grammar school. So those were they were similar discussions, uh, really different vibes to it, but um, the 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 decision for the Union 38 and Conway Grammar School was made last Tuesday to authorize the superintendent to do a hybrid if it looks like it still makes sense the day before school is supposed to start. Um, and the, the, um, the frontier one, which was just on Thursday, um, even though it involved many of the same people making the decision that the union 38 one was nearly a, a unanimous decision. The frontier one was a very narrow six to five vote. And, um, and the divisiveness of the vote itself, led the superintendent and the administration to want to spend the weekend getting backed with T because if you have a situation where the teachers just won't come in the building, then it doesn't matter what your plans are, you know, what, so, so, you know, you, you, you have, you know, in an attempt to get more buy-in um, from, from the teachers. And, and so it's, you know, Thursday was a four and a half hour epic meeting with 200 people where the people calling up, they feel so strongly about this. They've gone all summer, all spring without really being able to vent to anybody like what they're going through. And so they end up just bursting into tears and everybody watching bursts into tears and we all burst into <laughs> tears and it's a four and a half hour meeting and you're crying the whole time. And, um, and, and, but, and the result of that was that we knew, we knew that as a community, we were so divided and we have to do it all over again tomorrow. Um, so I, um, it, it, you're, you're describing it as a teacher parent split. It was, um, the, it, it wasn't an entirely, you know, but, but the majority, the clear majority of teachers that, um, wanted to do remote and the clear majority of parents, um, wanted to do in person and every parent of a kid with a IEP wanted to do in person to some extent. Um, so, it, but, but there were so many good arguments on both sides. It was so hard to decide. And, you know, and I, I ended up just basically putting my trust in someone that I have faith in, which is our superintendent and his administration. And so, um, to, to give him the flexibility that he asked for and because the, he did ask for the hybrid. So, um, but yeah, there's very much a sense that this is uh, uh, an uh, uncomfortable level of experimentation. You're, we're like between the trapeze bars right now. Mm. Um, yeah, um, it, you know, and, and you're getting all this pressure from Desi, you're in all these calls with them where they, you know, they really are pushing you to at least try to get children into the buildings in September and October because they're telling you that when flu season comes, you're going to be shut down for months because the symptoms are identical and you're going to be having, you know, normal years. It's there's days where it's 50% absenteeism because of flu. And that's just going to hit us over and over again. And we're going to be closing because you have to. Um, but there are so many questions. There are so many loose ends. There's, you know, there, there's so many people working so hard to try to tie these things up, but it's a never ending just series of issues and questions that, and the more you drill down, the, the more decisions have to be made and the more, it's just madness. So and we will I, look for, forward to the next chapter of this. Yeah. This, yeah. this story so, uh, in two weeks. But when we're so we're doing the you know basically the votes are going to be basically 
done over. You. We're basically doing the votes over again. Tomorrow is Frontier and Thursday yeah. is Give Me 38 again. And it's just. How many people are voting in, in the Frontier Committee? There's um, 11. No, the, yeah, there's nine of us. There's nine of us. Um, wow. A lot of pressure then on. OK. Yeah, well, and, and I, I feel terrible. I, I, I had a conservation commission meeting that lasted about 20 minutes. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to talk about that, though, because the result of that, um, you know, it's not our meeting. I didn't understand that. And I, I don't I, I, I didn't understand the decision that volunteers needed to get deed restrictions to pull weeds out of people's back lawn. And I, I, I we have to the conservation commission has to follow the dictates of the DEP and and so from day one Janet and and the conservation commission have been writing to the DEP saying can we do it this way and they're saying no you have to do it this way so so some of those things like the deed restrictions we may get some leeway over so that's what that's what we're talking to the DEP about now but, but you know if we send them an approved project that they already have thought about and not approved, they're not likely to say, well, okay. So. It seemed like a, I mean, it's, that's so much to ask of volunteers. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Just from the sense it, of volunteers. No, in, in a way it removes the pressure on us. I mean, it means we right. can approve something, but we, with them backing us up and saying, you're not following state law and tell us, what we did wrong and educate us and that's that's what happens yeah so yeah. It, it, it's also awful for all the people that want to do projects that are really great projects yeah and, okay uh so public comments is john heffern heffern in here i mean I'm, yes i am hi john there hi you how go. are you Bob? okay and everyone so you wrote a letter we've read your letter you want to talk sure um yeah just uh speaking on behalf of the residents of cricket hill area here uh just wanted the board to be aware of how many logging projects we've had to tolerate over the years i know there's the town forest one being considered and they're getting public input and i know we all did that, but it's part of a bigger picture of, uh, there's been projects going on since I've been here. There's been, uh, I think a really disastrous initial town forest project. I know Mary was involved in that and, you know, tried to help, but there was oil spills left and right. On that one, I have all, I, I provided a link. I'm sure you've seen, you may have looked at the pictures of those um and then you know the town for there was a uh, some kind of weather event came through that i guess was the ice storm so there was a project for that uh coles has just finished a, like a two to three year project and there was a big there was an oil spill on that i mean lash lashway lumber comes up with their trucks they don't seem to check them there was tiny droplets of oil all spilled all up and down cricket hill road and you know i happened to notice that i happened to be running or walking and the forester corrected, corrected it, but this is just what we have to go through. Um, and now the state has proposed 10 years of logging, presumably with Cricket Hill extension as the landing area. And now I was distressed to see that now this, we're back to the town forest again, logging that. Joni Schwartz did projects. Dean Lee Trust has had multiple projects here. I mean, this is a historic and uh, beautiful area and we seem to be, I'm not sure how it got established initially by the select board, but well, well, I hope you'll the stay sacrifice on the area for all this logging and the landing, you know, is on our, an area that's heavily used by both people that live here and people drive in here to use that area too. So it's a great meeting for you to be attending. I hope you stick around. We're going to be talking about the forestry you know, project that we're doing for the two town forest. And, and I don't know if you, if that's, I mean, we didn't, it, it worked out because you didn't talk last. Or 
you know, for on this meeting, and, and it works out well that that the foresters are going to be talking about, you know, their proposal, and you will get to hear it along with Priscilla and anyone else on the call. Uh, you know, I can't. Def I don't want to defend or 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 continue to trash the past practices of other select boards or whatever. All I can do is say this is what we're trying to do. And, and it's not our goal with the town forest. We don't have control over what CALS does or what the state does. You know, they have to follow the law, but they can, they, they own the land. Right, I just think no one is looking out for this particular area because it's project after project. The DEP, you know, will not take any action unless there's a 10 gallon oil spill or higher, so. There was a bill that in the legislature this year to to outlaw cutting down trees in DCR owned property. Uh, the bill didn't go very far. I'm sure it's going to be a bill in the next legislative <clears throat> legislative session. Then you know you should talk to. Yeah, I mean I I wrote yeah, letters you know. of support for it. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, you're you're not alone in being upset at the way the DCR seems to be treating our state owned forest. I mean, just one other little piece here that just you should all be aware of is when the state forest went through this um, process of designating, you know, whether it was a reserve or um, I forget, there was three different designations. Um, you know, we wrote a lot of letters um, to make the uh, reserve. Uh, the Con Conservation Commission of Conway supported that and. The DCR just said they didn't even seem to take uh, the views of the citizens into account. So we haven't been too happy with the DCR's um, oversight of the area. They were pretty much in denial of the, although I think give, giving credit to Mary, she tried to address the issue and was honest about it. But the DCR did nothing. You know, they wrote me a letter at the end saying no laws were broken. Sorry. So it's the DEP doesn't couldn't do anything, I guess, because it wasn't 10 gallons or higher. But there, it's just a continual um, kind of degradation, degradation of our enjoyment of our own backyard. I have no disagreement. You, you, you know, uh, uh, people in Leverett there have feel the same way. It was, or is it uh, Warwick? What was, what's the big state forest that got logged up there? They took down- Oh, Wendell, yeah. Wendell, Wendell. They took down a lot of old growth oaks and beautiful lumber. So, I mean, that's all I w wanted to say. Uh, you know, I know there's a process going on. I just looked at the plans, but, um, you know, the select board, I think, has to give permission to use that landing. I would hope at a minimum, uh, as this plan is considered, that at least the landing be moved off of Cricket Hill Extension. We've had to bear the brunt of all that for years and years and years. And now the state wants to do 10 more years there. So I would hope the town, if the town a project goes ahead, that the landing be moved somewhere else. Tom, have we heard about that yet? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? The, which Crick, project? Cricket Hill Road is going to be used as a landing site for a large lumbering project it, on, on, on the uh, state have, owned land. It's been, it is part I have of the not state heard plan. about that, no. Well, the state has a public plan that's been, that was on their website. That's typically where it's been. They're, they could use Cricket Hill uh, at the top as well, potentially. But that seems to be the established site now for all logging. Can you send the link of that to Tom? Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, please, please. So that's what no, I have to say, really. Just hope you guys were aware of the bigger picture here and how, yep. the, how the residents feel about it. Uh, and what I'm thrilled is that you're saying this in front of our two resident foresters here. So this is good. Okay. And John, I have a couple of comments too, but if it's okay, I'd like to just listen to about what um, our foresters have to say about that project. And um, I think, because it's all going to tie in together, I think. Okay? Which project, Bill? This is Mary. Hi, Mary. Which project? Well, I, you see our new one? 
No, no, no. I, 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 my understanding is that some of what John is talking about is related to your project that you're talking about. Is that? So that'll um, be soon. Yeah. What I heard John say is the past project is yes. wasn't. Yeah. Um. So let's move on to the uh, presentation. Okay. So, so the next thing on our agenda is to hear about the uh, the forest stewardship project. So, so what I would really like is I would like to give our two guests fifteen or twenty minutes. Do you think that's enough for you to do your presentation? You know, finish your presentation. We'll hear it all the way out, and then Phil and I might have a few questions, and then. Priscilla or, or, you know, John, or if anybody else joins us, you know, please feel free to, to ask questions. So, we are going to keep it in 20 minutes, right, Alex? Yes, I'll be the, uh, okay. I'll sort of be the, the timekeeper and, and facilitator as much as I can. Um, and I think we'll try, we'll try to see if I can share, uh, the host has to enable my ability to share my screen. That'll be you, Tom, I believe. Oh, there um, we go. You got it? Oh, great. So I have two monitors, so sometimes this gets a little bit funny, but let's make sure, so correct me if you're, uh, if you're seeing something other than the presentation. Starting screen sharing. You're good. You can see Conway Town Forest Stewardship Planning? Yes. Yep. Awesome. And then can you see the agenda? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> so it works. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you uh, for having us back. Uh, it's great to uh, be here to do a little presentation. Um, we're going to be try to be very conscious of time. And um, just two things to start is, you know, number one, that, you know, John to sort of talk about a little bit the issues that you're raising. You know, Mary and I, um, you know, responded to an RFQ for writing some management plans and doing a really thoughtful community outreach process. So uh, we're not doing anything that we weren't asked to do is I guess where I'd like to start there. Um, and hopefully what we're gonna present tonight will present the ideas that we've kind of, you know, articulated and dug up from the people in the town um, you know, we don't particularly have our own agenda in here other than to apply our professional knowledge to a set of ideas that you all are articulating. And there's a pretty broad range of ideas. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to, to present them. So tonight we're going to present some draft recommendations. Um, we have draft plans that we'll, we'll talk about them at the very end, but they'll be totally available to everybody to read. Um, so we haven't released anything yet. So you won't have seen anything yet, although we sent, uh, we sent this PowerPoint to the select board a few hours before this meeting. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. Um, we'd like to get some feedback and take questions and hear if we've missed anything. Um, we'll do a quick project update, just kind of where we're at. Um, and then we'll dig into each property and Mary is gonna take the lead on those two sections um, and we'll have questions throughout. Um, so, what we've done so far has been to uh, do a pretty awesome townwide survey where we had like pushing a hundred people respond. It was really cool. Um, and it was, a, it was a Google form. So it had a huge amount of information and we got a lot of great responses. We also did a, a hour and a half long workshop, uh, not in the woods as we had hoped, but on Zoom, um, but it, it went really well. And it was, it was interesting to hear people's inputs and we took tons of notes and they're incorporated into what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, but the, the main goals that the community articulated, you know, during uh, the workshop and then also during a bazillion phone calls that Mary has fielded and emails um, are these sort of four topics. And, you know, I, we don't have a huge amount of time so I'm not going to read them. Um, but, you know, I'll just talk, touch on the four kind of highlights which are the, you know, the main goals of these town forests according to the people who are responsible for taking care of them, which is 
the townspeople and, and you, the select board, um, you know, are to sustain biological richness, um, to sustain a whole series of ecological services and benefits that the properties provide, um, to sustain a resilient forest, um, and then also to promote the health and productive capacity of the trees. Um, and within that, we would lump the idea of, uh, you know, carbon sequestration, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, tonight. Um, so those are sort of the overarching goals. And, um, you know, we instantly can connect things to, you know, timber harvesting, which is what people always want to talk about when they talk about managing forests. But, you know, there was some interest occasionally in some things that are derived from the forest. But the town is very clear that like, that's not your number one goal, or it's not even in the top 100. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot, most of the recommendations that we're going to make tonight are getting at all these other topics, because that's what it seems to be most important to you guys. Um, so correct us if we have something wrong along the way, but that's kind of how we've come into it. Um, so we had to put a picture in because otherwise it's just text and that's really boring. This is a beautiful picture from the, the town farm forest, which uh, I just love. I took this picture when I was doing the inventory work, which is the other big field component of what we've done so far. But, you know, this is an amazing red maple tree that has all this awesome shaggy bark on it, which is where like bats nest. There's a big chunk of that same tree that fell over and is just laying there and it's awesome habitat and just wonderful. Big, beautiful red oak that's growing, raining down acorns. And then this cool little hemlock inclusion, which is all this greenery, um, which is a place where animals like to hang out. It provides shelter. So, you know, this picture kind of captures a lot of the value that's going on at the town farm forest. And you can see a lot of that on the Fournier also. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, so here I will hand it over to Mary. What we have is um, a map of the property um, with some proposed practices and different things that are on the map. And you can read the legend while Mary is talking. Um, and we'll kind of get into them specifically through a series of uh, slides. You ready, Mary? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Can you move it to the next slide? All right. Um, so what we have, we took the survey results, workshop, emails, personal conversations, walks in the wood, I, woods, both woods that I've had with residents from Conway, and we created a set of sustainable forestry practices that could possibly move you towards the goals and objectives that the community stated in the responses to the survey. We understand statistics. It was not conclusive, but it was a good, there was a good outpouring and we, we felt that we listened. And what sustainable forestry practices are, they're simply tools that a forest owner can use to achieve the goals that they hold for their forest ecosystem. They can range, people seem to equate it straight with timber, timber harvesting. That is one of the tools. Silviculture is one of the tools. But as you can see from the, the list that we present, there's a whole lot of other things that you can do. And what we tried to do to come up with this set, we took all the data we had and we made a, a conclusive set of anything you could possibly do on the town forest based on what people were stating. And we present that in the final document and in the documents for review as an appendix. This is a subset that we derived, and that's what we're presenting tonight. We try to make our decisions about what, to, what kind of practices to use in the forest based on the community's goals, based on listening through the visioning process. And it was really clear to us that your community is interested in any use are only interested in the use of sustainable forestry practices when they will support ecological function in ecosystem goods and services. Income is not important to your community at all. And we try to demonstrate that in this list. So the list, I list um, the stands. That column coordinates to um, stands on the map. 
the types are the kinds of trees growing there. The forest management recommendations are the sustainable practices that we derived from that full set. We have no agenda attached to it. This subset could be longer, could be shorter, could have nothing on it but grow the trees till their biological maturity, or could have more things on it. It's, we had to conclude and present a document. That's how the list was derived. So if you check, if you, we go to the first row in the chart, um, in the inventory, we're going to start with Fournier. In the inventory, there's minimal invasive plants on the Fournier property. It's amazing. There's not a lot of them. So one practice you might consider is control, to control these plants. Because the stocking is so light, you can do it manually. You can hand remove them. And then at the, the final column of the chart, we tie the practice directly back to those goals that were presented on slide three. So that's one possibility is invasive plant control. The map chart indicates where that practice might be done. And I, I got to blow up the scale because it's so tiny. I'm not sure which color is invasive work. Can you help me with that, Alex? Yeah, we actually don't have that on this map because you put so many layers on and then it looks kind of messy. Okay. But basically there is a tiny little clump of Phragmites right along the trail. And then in the southwest corner in the pine, there's a little bit of bittersweet and some barberry. So it's, it's quite dispersed and it's very manageable, which is really exciting because a lot of forests are not that way. And then a second possible practice is the creation of young forest patches. This will be areas where you picked where there was a natural opening and we propose on the Fournier piece that trees are not removed from the site, you may be knocked down, weakened trees, diseased or damaged trees, leave them on site as, by, as nutrients. So that is one and that supports um, biodiversity. biodiversity now, it's not only species, it's size, age. It, it includes um, a, a range of diverse attributes within the forest. It will also support forest resilience. Resilient forests have all ages in them. And it would support, um, the science is, is not in fully on climate mitigation with the use of forest ecosystems, but some of the literature is suggesting that if you have all ages, you have storage in the older trees and accumulation in the younger trees. So if you made the opening in the woods, younger trees fill it. Another practice, the third row, is native shrub planting. There are some riparian zones in some of the drier upland sites that have sparse native shrub stocking on the forest floor. So that is one sustainable practice you might consider. And that also supports bi biodiversity, um, the planting in the riparian zone would um, increase the filtering capacity, so you're working with an ecological service of water quality, the hydrologic cycle. And one of the, the town came out very strongly for trails, recreational use of both forest properties. So with the trails, you could, we recommend a possible creation. There's a dashed line on the map that sort of creates a figure eight with the existing main trail into Fournier, that's something that you may consider developing, um, creating a narrow path that does the figure eight through the forest and brings the walker to some of the other interesting attributes on the land. You may consider mapping the trail system and having a, a simple inexpensive trail map available at a kiosk or a town hall. And um, we also think signage might be useful just for directional and permitted use. Maybe you don't want ATVs in there. Maybe horses are okay. So that, and, and you would have to, as far as developing that figure eight trail, you'd want to have consensus from the community before we did that. We also, there was a strong voice in the community about doing nothing. And we feel if you do active management, you really should consider setting up reserve zones using a principle, a sustainable forestry practice known as proforestation, where you do nothing. You let nature unfold on the acreage. So we propose an area to do that in. 
It's um, some of the more interesting vernal pool and wetland complexes, and the entire Hemlock Harwood Grove in the northern section of the property is it's pretty special. And to not do anything, it would be it would be pretty interesting to watch it evolve through time with the warming climate. We hey, Mary, you, you, Mary, we have about maybe like a minute more on this, and then we should move to Town Farm. Okay, um, educational outreach, where you do conduct community tours, maybe engage the school, um, work in into as a part of the environmental science curriculum. Alex had some input from the principal there, and she was interested. Um, we do propose, or it is one possibility you can entertain a silvicultural practice, crop tree release. Crop tree release is a minimal harvest. It is not, um, you could not equate it to what's go, what went on in Coles, what went on on the town farm in 2007, or what some of the state's proposals are pretty minimal. But it's a minimal practice where you pick trees you really want to grow, either for their high quality lumber in the future, or they're interesting for habitat and valuable for habitat, or they're just uniquely pleasing aesthetically. And you, you take out maybe one or two trees around the crowns of those crop trees you've chosen so that they increase their productivity. Could you go to the next slide? Alex, please. Um, and in a part of the grant, it was mentioned, if you're gonna do anything, it may be wise to engage the town and create and maybe codify or have somewhere archived a best management practices policy that Conway wants and uh, mandates that whoever's gonna do any kind of work, whether it's trail maintenance, timber harvesting, on the use of the land for protection of soil and water. And then another um, possible practice would be there's a lot of interest in the Commonwealth right now for using forests as carbon pools and carbon sinks. And that's, if those programs evolve, you may want to consider participation in it. Finally, on the Fournier, your boundaries are somewhat clear from the barbed wire fencing, the historic farm boundary, but you may consider some signage along the bounds. So especially at the northern access point from the extended trail system. Those are possible sustainable forestry practices you could consider. This is a draft. This is a subset of a lot of ideas that will be available. It can be amended in any capacity necessary. <laughs> so we could go on to um, the town farm. Yeah, and a lot of them are I, I'd want to say that you will see redundancy because your, the goals and objectives that were elicited and derived from our survey work and our initial workshop where we considered them universal to both properties. So you will see a, sort of a lot of the same concepts and serving the same ecosystem, services and goods and ecological function. Those are the goals you're interested in serving. These are proposed ideas and practices that might get you there if the town can form a consensus around implementing any of them. Okay, thank you. Let's go hey, to- So Bob, Bob, do you have a sense, do you wanna pause now to talk about Fournier for five minutes or do you wanna save everything for the end? Oh, you're, you're muted, sorry. Unmute. Okay, I would rather you guys go on. I'm afraid if we start with questions, we're never Perfect. going to get back to have you finish the thing. So, all right. Okay. We'll, we'll even skip the fun photo interlude then. Um, <laughs> but these are these are 13 year old trees on the Fournier Forest. They're growing like crazy, and they're really cool. Um, but on to the town farm. So here's the the large map, and then we'll we'll dig into it uh, on a stand by stand basis here. Um, practice by practice basis. As I said, there are some redundancies. Um, the invasive plant issues on town farm are a little more extensive. You have areas that you could easily do it manually, hand pulling, root pulling, and brush cutting, clipping. And you have some 
denser areas that may, you may want to explore integrative vegetation management, the use of chemicals. If that's the direction you're going, you can use <coughs> biological means, goats, shade, don't open any more sunlight through time. But you do have some invasive issues to consider as a practice up there. Trails were, again, a, a, um, a theme that was recurrent in our workshops. So up there, <coughs> you've got the old logging roads that have grown in to seedlings and saplings heavily. It's good soil that regenerated well along the road systems. So you might consider brushing them out or mulching them out so that you could create a, a loop off of the town, the old town roads going through the different areas of the forest and back down to the town road. Um, th there is some really neat, the stone wall structures up there are very unique. It was, as you know, it was your, um, it was your town farm where indigent people were allowed to um, farm agricultural crops, keep livestock, and support themselves. And so, I mean, there's the old cemetery, there's the bait cellar hole, which is unique, and then there's corrals, stock pens, it's, and the stone wall structures have been maintained, and they're, they're really interesting. So um, signage, again, could be a practice you participate in up there, whether directionally or educational. You can put up signs that talk about these cultural and historical features. And then we again touched on the, a practice that would create a refuge, a preservation area, the Pro Forest Station Sustainable Forestry Practice, a 24-acre area in the, south, in the southwestern corner, that orange blob. It's a, um, it's a hemlock hardwood grove with a spring seep that's kind of it's special. There's rocks, cliffs going there. And oh, back to the trails. There's from that the green highlighted trail, we proposed if you cut a narrow um, side trail that's in and out, there's you climb a rock cliff and there's the vista potential to the north that you can see the hills in the distance, but you're also perched above the canopy, so you could have that interesting view of the tops of the trees. So Proforestation is reserving sections of the forest that will be undisturbed through time. Um, again, another practice, the last row in this, on this slide is the town may consider the development of a best management practices that perhaps exceed the DCR's mandate so that you're feeling there's better protection for water and quality, for soil and water quality through the course of any sustainable forestry practice, whether it's timber harvesting or trail maintenance, installation of erosion control on trails. Okay, Alex, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, we propose the same sort of civil cultural practice. You can't equate that. That is a timber harvest. Crop to release. Um, in the document, there will be a definition of these civil cultural practices that will describe exactly what a crop tree release does. Basically, it takes the trees you want to grow for a long time, and you remove a couple of trees from their crowns so they have increased productivity and vigor. Um, that you might consider through the oak hardwood grove and the white pine hardwood grove. They were areas that were cut before. It would cut about 10 to 15 percent of the standing material in those forest stands. That's a, I, I consider that a conservative harvest. It is not equatable to anything that's really gone up on up on the hill. Um, we also, another practice, the second row is from the past harvest, thousands of seedlings um, developed, and now they're, turned, they're maturing into saplings, but you have a minimal component of red oak, and red oak is such an important, essential um, tree in our, our New England forest that it would, be, it would be interesting to consider implanting red oak seedlings down the road, either in congruence with a, a silviculture, a timber harvest, or just on their own because you want to, I, I would think it would be important to keep red oak as a component in this forest. Then on um, the third row, the area that's, um, the white area, um, yeah, there you go. Yep, that is a, um, that was the red pine stand. The red pine stand, 2007 when we went in, it was being 
attacked by two pathogens, and we did a salvage harvest of disease and sick trees. Then I got hit by the ice storm. Then, and I was responsible for that, we went back in and took the trees because they had snapped, broken in half, uprooted. They were damaged. They would have just rotted up there. And But what resulted after that is the establishment of hardwood trees. Um, all species, red maple, sugar maple, black birch, yellow birch, white ash, black cherry, again, minimal red oak, but there's thousands per acre. And you may, one practice that you could consider would be to weed those out, much like your garden. You're not taking a lot of them. You're looking and seeing plants tend to exert natural dominance, like in your garden. So you're going to take a few out so that the, the plants you keep, they grow better. That's a possible sustainable forestry practice you could do in what in my mind is the the old red pine plantation site. Um, again, the participation in the carbon program, um, science is unclear. They do have a lot of ideas about how to grow and tend to forest if you're going to store and accumulate carbon. And um, the select board is expressing interest in that. The Commonwealth is moving in the direction of offering such a program in, in, in Massachusetts. So having it in your management plan allows you the choice of participating in the future or not. So the last slide for this, or the last, yeah, it should be the last one. Um, again, education, you have this beautiful resource. I've already decided that <laughs> COVID or not, I would be willing to take small groups of people if we socially distance to walk through and before the weather changes and just tell them what I saw. And if and, and that may be something you consider doing, or signs, the cultural and historical signs, and the boundaries. Up here, you uniquely have the Commonwealth's got blue signs and blazes. Coles have their signs and blazes. It may be just good to have a sign that says you are now entering the, town, you know, the, the Conway Town Farm Forest. So those are a subset of all of the ideas we collected in the survey and the, Zoom, the first Zoom workshop, they are a subset that can be revised, adapted in any way. It could be bigger, it could be smaller. We are not attached to any of them. But these are ideas and sustainable, viable, sustainable forestry practices that would encourage your forest to provide um, the ecological goods and services and perform the ecosystem, provide the, eco the ecosystem goods and services and sustain its ecological function. And, and that's it. That is our list, the quick, the quick presentation. So please, any questions? You, you, you did it, Mary. You did the second one in eight minutes exactly. Awesome. So. I wasn't um, too fast. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's going to be you know, this, the idea tonight is just to, to present these, these general ideas. And on the 26th, we're going to do a much longer with sort of as long as people want to ask questions um, workshop session to finalize recommend, uh, recommendations. Um, and just other next steps are that this week we'll have the draft plans available. Um, we're going to put them on the town website, and then we'll also have a a Google folder that's just open to the public so anybody can download them. They'll be PDFs. Um, and um, if we have time tonight, we can talk a little bit about a potential other survey, but I think now would be good to get into some questions and see if we're missing anything. Okay, well, I have a couple questions and uh, I don't see Phil on here, although maybe here is farther. Uh, uh, there he is. Okay, he's still here. Good. Um, so and so so I guess as select board members we will go first and then uh, and then the, but it's really it's really the public input that I want you to get. Um, so th for me, when I read through this, there were things I didn't understand. Some of them were a little more clear. The idea, but there there were words in here that are troubling words. Um, the idea of a patch cut. So what I heard from what Mary said was it's not clear cutting a little patch in the middle of the forest. She said, there's a natural opening and just leaving it alone. Did I get that right? Um, a natural opening where you maybe expand it by cutting down and leaving in the forest, um, declining trees, damaged trees, so that you make the natural opening bigger. So you, more seedlings could develop. 
I think not, uh, not cutting down, you know, perfectly good, healthy, nice trees in the. No, to make a hole. No, that is correct. Okay. So then, and the other words that I'll say that scare me in the sound, and when I look up to try to understand what they mean, in the general sense, the, the idea of silvicultural practices, and which seem like they mean almost whatever they you want them to mean, uh, making changes to the forest to try to push it in the direction that you want it to go. And so that's a little worrisome. And the idea of what's called crop tree release, choosing crop trees and then clearing around them, even cutting down 10% of the trees sounds like a lot to me. Um, and especially when, when we haven't defined what the crop trees are. Um, so I, I do see some research about crop tree release to achieve old growth forest characteristics. And so, so there might be the lar very largest trees in the forest that you're trying to defend, um, which is, I assume, what old growth forest characteristics would be. But, but uh, cutting down a bunch of trees to try to save another tree that's, you know, high quality timber or something isn't what we want to accomplish. Um, and then the same idea of called small gap creation, that sounds like the same idea, but, I'm, but it's hard to know. Um, creating little gaps around trees that you want to protect. Um, so I'm glad that you put in stuff called proforestation uh, areas, although in the Fournier property, they're very small. I mean, you know, um, especially if I compare them with, what did you call the other ones? Um, well, Bob, we're, we're talking about like eight to 24 acres on the Fournier. So we're showing eight on the map, but you could conceivably okay. make it different. And right. Mary, right. Mary, chime in if you want, but the- Yeah, I think we had decided on 24 acres versus the 25 acres of a crop to release. So they're equitable. That sounds like a better trade off to me. Yeah. Uh, um, and um, I think I, I might have said it too quickly, but crop tree is defined as the owner wishes to define it. A crop tree could be high quality, high value red oak saw timber tree that's 24 inches, you're going to grow it to 30. A crop tree could be a 38 inch sugar maple with a bunch of cavities in it that something's dinning in right now that you're going to grow it throughout its biological life. A crop tree could be an almost dead red pine tree that pileated woodpeckers have been hammering on that you're just going to keep it there for use by whoever's going to use it through time. Crop tree does not, I, I see why the word is troubling and I have to think of a, a way to present it, but it may be desirable trees um, or trees that are in alignment with your values and objectives because when I see crop tree release, I expand my thinking on crop tree and I don't directly equate it to a high value, vigorous timber tree that's going to appreciate in value over time. I equate it to what is it that I heard from the community that they wish to do in this forest? Exactly. And we heard a lot about habitat. We heard a lot about um, having mature trees in the woods. Like you said, you might pick, you might pick a 24 inch tree. It's got maybe a beech tree that's only 17 inches growing on its south side. If you took that beech tree away, that 24 inch is gonna get bigger. It's not going out of the forest. It's not gonna be removed. So I think um, we could definitely be better articulated over the, the, the idea of what you would be releasing in any kind of a conservative silvicultural practice. Great. Uh, just a couple more things. There were a lot that I really liked here. You know, I, I really like the fact you're looking at removing invasives, especially in the Fournier property where there's almost none there already. Is that something you're proposing you would do or you would describe it as something that we could do? I, we are proposing that somehow the town figures out how to make decisions around their town forest. Maybe you want to... Um, create a forestry committee, a town forest committee, but there should be some body that holds the, the history and the archive and organizes the consensus around these practices or their implementation 
or not. And then you decide how do we pay for it. There's a lot of state and federal grants available for this kind of work on community-owned forests. So who you get to do it could be bid out, much like how we showed up for this one. It could be decided by the Board of Select person, people. It can be decided by a forester committee. But, but um, we're not trying to sell you on anything. <laughs> we're saying they're there. It's wise to consider the removal, and we will give you all, we will empower you, and the plan itself expounds on these concepts. We will try to empower and educate you in the plan to be able to implement it yourself and to know where to go for help, who to call for money. No, that it, I, it was hard for me to imagine that with the grant that we got to do this project that you guys were saying, yes, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And you're saying that these are good ideas that we should consider doing. And but it wasn't clear when I read this what it was that you you might do. So that that's all. Um, and the only other one had to do with what's called best management practices. So are you proposing that you might suggest best management practices that we might follow, or again that we establish them at a future time? Um, I. I, you cut out a little on my end for the beginning of that question. Which were you unclear about? Well, best management practices. You know, so you've learned a lot of stuff about the wishes of the community. You've done the survey. You've had meetings. You've talked to people. You're going to hear from people tonight. Um, and, and yes, I really hope we can write down, we can document what the best management practices are for, you know, for 20 years from now when we have to do this again. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, we, I, and Alex, please chime in. I have a lot of resources. Um, the DCR's mandate on BMPs is marginal. And so there's a lot of other documents that you could consider and perhaps adapt or add to that treat the earth, soils in either trail maintenance or timber harvesting, water crossing, any interaction with the wetlands, in a more comprehensive manner than the DCR's mandate. So yes, there are resources we can empower you with, Bob. Okay. Yeah, and I think if I can chime in, the one thing I would highlight there is the, it's mostly a question of, of process and community engagement in those best management practices. People typically think about best management practices as you know having spill kits to keep oil out of the woods or having stream crossings done correctly. But what we found here, and it, it popped up over and over and over again, was just that people are generally up for being, uh, for learning stuff and for being open-minded about things. What people really don't like is having things surprise thrown at them. And so like the, the, the process and the community engagement around whether it be putting up signs to show the boundary or you know, doing a crop tree release, like any of that stuff, the, the consensus building and sort of how do you do that? That's the perhaps the, the management practice that is the most important here. I have one more question. You have an acronym that you use a couple times called CWM. I'm sure I should know what that is, but I don't. Uh, coarse woody material. Oh, okay. So just big chunks of wood that are laying in the forest and the the uh, you know the the, the Germanic origins of forestry are often say, oh my goodness, why did you waste all this wood in the forest? But uh, where we are in a big forested landscape, that material is really awesome to intentionally leave in on the landscape for wildlife structure, nutrient return, and slow release of carbon. So I've hogged my time. Phil, what do you want to do? Well, just, just following up on your um, best practices uh, manual conversation, just, are, has any town ever tried to do that by way of bylaw that you're aware of? Um, I know some of the towns down east have bylaws that restrict use of town roads by log, by log trucks, coincidentally. Um, so I know there's been trucking bylaws. I know Heath, the town of Heath has an interesting bylaw I haven't read in a while that um, restricts a little bit. Um, Operation in wetlands. I have read uh, in in do, working on this project. I pulled a whole bunch of literature, and I pulled some literature from Pennsylvania. And one community they had they crafted with you know input from 
people in the community, knowledgeable harvesters, they crafted a set of guidelines on equipment size. You know, a lot of what I think people object to in a timber harvest is due to the size of the equipment that we're using today. There's still small equipment out there. Perhaps you want yours done with smaller equipment, you know, a older skidder that's got a minimal wheelbase. So you can't have a wide road, you can't carry a lot of material. Uh, those are ideas. If yeah, that answers your question. I can yeah. speak. I can speak quickly to Vermont and New Hampshire, where I do most of my work, and it's, you know, each each town. It's very similar in terms of what the towns can do. Um, you know, New Hampshire has some statewide legislation that enables towns to uh, identify priority wet air, wetland areas and do specific things around those. Vermont actually has, you know, the right to farm law in a forestry setting, which is the right to forest. Um, and it's, it's actually, you know, quite, you know, it's very supportive of a lot of management in the woods. Um, so that, you know, is just an example of another thing that, that a lot of, you know, that one whole state has decided to do, which would just say like, hey, the careful management of our forests is really important, just like right to farm or right to do forestry. Right, and, and I mean- and to, uh, Phil, to go back to the question about bylaws, the eastern towns, what they do, their bylaws mandate, if you're going to run a log truck on a town road, you got to post a bond. And, and then you got to adhere to a set of principles if you want your money back. That's how they work it. Well, I would love to see some examples of that. I, I, I looked okay. briefly, but I couldn't find anything. Um, but that's, that's interesting to me. Just that's the kind of thing that I think the town would support, I, I think. Um, yeah, uh, you get you get into some very weird stuff with milk trucks and oil delivery trucks and weights and things that gets really dicey really fast because you become rather arbitrary. Um, but it it's certainly something to explore. Yeah, um, and then you know, I, so I, I mean, I I get that that the work product that you got is sort of boxed in by the nature of your bid and the nature of the project that you were bidding on. Um, but the 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 um what 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 to me is like personally what what I, where I'm really coming from is just that we we've already applied for the next Mohawk Woodland Trail Partnership uh, grant uh, round and we applied for I guess it's twenty five thousand for a feasibility study to, um, for carbon to participate in a carbon credit project um, involving both of our town forests. Um, However, the, in order to participate in that, we need to actually come up with 1,500 acres within the town of Conway to participate in. So we have started the ball rolling. We do have a, a meeting coming up with the Deerfield Select Board because they own, they own extensive um, forest, forested acres as part of their, uh, uh, as part of that town's uh, uh, water reservoir. And, um, you know, and, and, and but we could also we would also envision using private property. And the one thing that 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 I was told over and over again is you have to have an active forest management plan in order to participate in the car. Um, and that that plan of necessity has to include some cutting, at least of diseased trees. That was the, the one thing that they were specific about when, when I asked about it, that they don't that um, that it's I forget what the whole line of reasoning was, but that that um, so so t t to me, a lot of what you produced and a lot of what I saw was responsive to carbon storage. Um, but but I, I, what I was unsure of is whether some of those other goals or ideas were negating carbon storage. Which one, Phil, specifically? Yeah. Um, all I know is that there were there were boxes where you said carbon storage and then there were all the other boxes with all the other ideas that didn't say st carbon storage so what i was wondering was do any of those other ideas negatively impact carbon storage i i've done a lot of work on this i i wrote plans for three big towns and i'm actually just starting the plan for south deerfield their watershed lands there's they own 980 acres in the town of conway yes. to write a carbon plan so no, they are not going to rule you out. They don't negate it. Carbon, as I say, and I, I try to tell people over and over, the science isn't 
fully known yet. There's a lot of ideas out there. And the, the, the basics are grow your trees a long time, get them old, try to have new growth, hence those small gaps between your crop trees be, so that you have accumulating younger trees. And actually you are in such good shape for a carbon forest, your both town forest, because you have that. You have older trees and you have younger trees. So you have the balance between storage and accumulation. You have a, a town that is engaged in, in values, understanding the use of your forest and what goes on there so that you can guarantee in a carbon program these woods are going to be woods forever. That's a, that's a really biggie. They don't want to invest in these programs and then have people turn around and convert the use down the road. So you're positioned to enter a program. You're positioned well. None of the practices in this presentation would negate your involvement or your use of these two town forests and their aggregation into a larger pool for carbon. Yeah, and if, Mary, if I could jump in there, you know, the, the, the main kind of forest vulnerability that we see across both forests is, is the hemlock component. And, you know, hemlock has a couple different invasive uh, above, two different insects who, uh, you know, if you go down in Connecticut, you're seeing like mortality from the like killing of hemlock trees by these bugs. They're on the Fournier. We didn't see any on town farm. Um, so, you know, if, if somebody ponies up a bunch of money to have carbon stored in your forest and then half the forest dies, uh, you know, they're going to not be so psyched about that. And so that's something where you want to have some level of ability to respond or manage proactively to be in a position to guarantee a, a vibrant forest. You know, if you have a, a thick hemlock forest that grows up, 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 up with nothing underneath of it, and then it all dies, you have a big pause in carbon in that forest and you have immediate release of dead and dying trees, methane being produced in trees as they decompose. So it's, it's a, you want to have a, a diverse portfolio. Um, and, you know, the Fournier property particularly is like 40 some percent hemlock, um, which is great. It gives it a lot of its character now, but it, it's also a, just a vulnerability over the next 50 years. Hmm. Well, we are seeing a lot of mortality in our, area certainly yeah and it's like i mean you go down to like north carolina they're like completely dead <laughs> connecticut they've been limping along for 20 years it seems like it's kind of okay but like it's not vibrant luscious lovely hemlock but i mean i, I, think I heard mary make sort of an allusion to the, to, to the commonwealth of massachusetts long rumored carbon credit program and um well and that's where you're that's where um Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership is heading. Bob O'Connor, who's the, kind of the head guy down there at EEA, he, he has a vision of using Western Mass to store carbon, to pull it up, to use our forest to help mitigate climate in the future. And it's a, it's a clear vision, and it's a very um, conceivable, possible vision. And um, so, like your grants in for that study, Williamstown put in a massive grant for the same thing to try to figure out forestry, sustainable forestry practices specific to encourage carbon friendly or carbon, I can't, I don't think friendly is the term, I, I think I made that up, but a forest that is um, suitable for use as a carbon sink. And one of the big things with the literature suggests with carbon is in order to be a good, strong player in that game, you have to be able to show the verifiers that your forest is doing something uniquely different, above and beyond common practice in the landscape locally and regionally throughout the Commonwealth. You can honestly rest assured that you are. Even if you did every practice that's on that list. And bear in mind, you cut 2007-2009. The way um, one of the rules, one of the suggested guidelines for carbon management is when you go in and create a disturbance in the forest, such as a timber sale, a timber harvest, you wait a long period before another disturbance. So you wait 15 to 20 years. So you wouldn't even be these and in the management plan we have dates assigned to each recommended practice 
So the practice wouldn't even be debated or ready for community involvement on consensus until 25 to 29. And so the way that we wrote the plan, the, way, the condition of your force now, you could easily establish your additionality. You could easily establish, yeah, we're doing things a cut above, business as usual. So that's a little bit more <laughs> data on the carbon deal. <laughs> Yeah, when was the town forest last harvested? Pardon? When was the town forest last harvested? Um, 2007 was the salvage harvest in the red pine for the disease and um, the bacteria and pathogen pest and a um, general all around cut through the rest of the stands, a selection harvest. And then the ice storm hit. Then we went back in in 2009 to um, conduct a second salvage. So 2000, we were out of there by the, I don't know, it was before, it was maybe early summer 2010. So, so you're in here. Yeah. So you have a period of time. What do you think, Dan? It hasn't been 15 or 20 years since the last harvest. Exactly. You have a period of time. In the management plan, the dates we assign to that practice are down the road. They're 25, 2025 plus, or 2025 to 2030, because the state's um, requirements for fulfilling and completing a forest stewardship management plan require that you put the practice you recommend and the date that you recommend it being done. So the dates that we have are in sync with the scheduling that is intelligent and being promoted now with the science that we know to date, long periods of rest and recovery between a forest disturbance, because it helps the forest reestablish all of its ecosystem functions. Its ecological function comes back up to where it was pre-disturbance. That's why, that's why they're suggesting if you're using the woods to store accumulate carbon, give it that time to recover itself. And did someone else have a question? I thought someone was chiming in. Yeah, John, I, I heard you. Yeah. Um, yeah, related. Hold on one second. Related to that, I, uh, so the reserves, I think, as Bob mentioned, were fairly small. Given that, I don't believe the state or Coles or anyone else is trying to create any old growth. Um, and also, I know, as Mary said, and uh, Alex, the science is not. Uh, determined, but I know some are saying that old growth does do the best for carbon sequestration and storage. You know, why did uh, the reserve sections, why are they so small compared to the whatever you call it, crop? Crop, crop uh, release. Yeah. Well, what what sounds like a fancy name for logging to me, but. But we're, uh, I mean, we're, we're proposing anything from, you know, a third to half of the acre of the forested acreage being in those conditions. So it's hard to show that on a map, but, you know, you know, we can draw that line wherever people would like. That's not the, you know, it, you get latched on to a visual you see. So I'm sorry about that, but it can be, you know, a bigger acreage. Um, and the, the crop tree release piece, you know, that, you know, we do a lot of work. Our company does a huge amount of different types of work. And we do a lot of like mass tree release where we're just cut clearing around oak trees. So they produce acorns for animals. Um, so it's not really. Well, logging, I think, but... John, to answer directly, what we try to do is listen to everybody's voice. And my interpretation of the data, and we have the survey, we have the derivative out of the survey in the workshop. People were, um, accepting the use of a timber harvest if it was going to serve certain goals, not economic goals. So in order to do justice to our, our concept, our understanding of community-based forestry was not to let any one voice take the lead. If the town creates a mechanism whereby you put it on the ballot or somehow get a straight up and down Democratic vote to lock it up as a reserve, to use proforestation universally, then that would be your policy. 
our presentation of these ideas were to um, honor each person's value that they held for these woods. That's why we divvied it up in that way. Yep. I hear you, Mary. I just, I just think in general that uh, these projects don't really think about the land around them, you know, like the state has their piece and Coles does their piece. This is a small piece, but we're not looking at the reserve. You know, there's no one else is doing reserves. And I think that's been, yeah. can I, just one more question would be on the um, landing isn't shown on this. Um, how, how is that determined and what you're thinking on where the landing or landings would be? Um, uh, which map? Well, of course, you know I'm interested in the town forest, but you could answer for both. Or maybe it is on there, just not seeing it. The town farm. Um, ideally, say you decide you are going to harvest timber, and the town can agree upon it. And it's out a ways, a few years down the road. Maybe it's 2030. And you're going to do it light. You're going to do it conservative with small equipment. If you could raise the funds or seek some sort of grant to um, cover up some of those ledges with stone, um, restore those culvert crossings, you could get a triaxle up into your own land. That would be the ideal situation. We were um, granted permission by DCR to use that spot we used down on Old Crooked Hill. And but if you create a policy, if you create BMPs, one, maybe one of them is, you don't haul stuff all the way down and out. You land it interior and you put the road work in and the commitment to keep that road okay through time. And, and, and that may solve, it would still have trucks on the road, John. I, I don't know how to get around that one. But um, that landing that they have on the state land, it's not even a good landing. It's such a tight little spot. That the new one? I, the one that they're using on Old Cricket Hill that Coles just used with Dylan Field. Well, that's it's Cricket not Hill, not Old Cricket Hill, Mary. And that would be, but you know what I mean when you, he had yeah, a deck of log Cricket, really close. Cricket Hill to Extension the is the correct name, I believe. Yeah, yeah. The road, the, that landing is a tight landing. Yeah. It's awful well, at for it's, working. At least it's the not truck adjacent. had a back in, which isn't ideal. So, it's not adjacent I mean, to the wetland like the old one, so that's good. Can I ask one more question? You guys had a long discussion on the best management practice, which as we know, the state ones, which I've read very thoroughly, are kind of recommended practices. And I don't believe there's any way to enforce those, although I think the foresters generally try to. Um, could the town version have some enforcement? So for example, if there is an issue, you know, it has to be remediated or whatever town decides to uh, make, like improve the quality or the enforceability of the state practices. Um, the state practices, I don't know if you're gonna be able to influence the DCR crew to do anything different. Um, no, but I'm I, saying put those in the town ones with that. Well, could you I think the way those? to do it, John, the way that I do it on other properties is through the contract. You have to have enough money secured that they're going to think twice about deviating from the plan and causing any kind of damage because they'll lose their money. And that, that's been my only experience of a way to rein them in. You can have, you can have the policy, you can have the BMP, you can codify it, and then it can be transferred into a harvest contract if someone's going to buy your material. I think you need to wisely pick your operator. You have to have the right person for the right job, the right equipment for the job. And you need your enforcement mechanism is contractual supervision. And there's got to be their money somewhere on the table. That's no, I think, the only, I just, way, I've been, that's the only right. way I've been able to do it. <laughs> You know that original town forest project. I thought you told yep. me that um, you had to go with lowest bidder or something. And as you, as you, I think, will agree, it was the loggers were terrible. Um, uh, well, they had to go with the highest bidder. How they do went with that who, situation. They went with who paid the most. And if you remember, there was like three crews in there by the end. 
Um, one guy was really, really good, Dave Puffer. He was excellent. But the mill that bought it kept having issues with their man and changing who showed up. But if you had a policy that said only X size machine could operate on this land, it, like you can craft it in those manners. And these, this is talking from experience, John. This is having learned as the um, logging industry's mechanized revolution has progressed through the last 20 years. We didn't, we didn't really understand, and, and it, it came to us, and we had to figure out how to work with this huge equipment because a lot of people have it now. Not everybody, though. So you can craft the project you want and um, contract with an operator that will give you the type of harvest and end product. Leave the land the way you're most comfortable with. So those are ways to influence that, if that's answering your question. Yes, thank you. Priscilla, are you still here? No. No. Okay. Well, I think I, I need to get off, but I thank you very much for uh, being invited and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank to you. Speak. One question I had for Bob before he goes. So yep. am I interpreting correctly, you're interested in the development and encouragement of old growth characteristics on Town Forest. That isn't something that was had come up before. Is that a correct interpretation? Well, I interpret old growth as meaning carbon storage. Maybe they're not the same, but to me, when I hear old growth, it makes me think about carbon storage. So, so okay. if you want to interpret everything I said for old growth meaning carbon storage, that, that to me, I and think that's, that's correct. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's to a. To me, big, big trees mean carbon storage, and big trees aren't necessarily the oldest tree in the woods. But, but I, thank you for that clarification. It, are there any more questions? We should yeah. let you go back to your business. Oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to make um, a point that to, to design those um, policies on how you're going to forest and, and, and what restrictions you're going to place, whether it's the size of the equipment or it's the cleanup that happens afterwards, it's a huge amount of effort on the town's part. And, and I don't know that we have those resources to, to put that in place. So it's a, it's a really big project to embark on, but the follow through is so important and actually the setup and the follow through to to protect and, and figure out what we want to do with it. Like, you know, I've, I think you started to mention, I haven't heard the whole meeting, but we've had a couple of bad experiences where people haven't left it as we expected it to be left. Um, the last time the state forest was done, it was my understanding that they were going to cover up all the trap rock they left on the roads and that never happened. And um, the last people that logged through coals, I, and I understand that was, you know, a state thing that they allowed coals to log and set up their landing, but they, they left a horrible site behind. They didn't fix that up at all. It's, it's completely rutted. It was almost impassable in the spring. So what are, you know, I'm presenting this to my select board actually, what, what are we gonna do to make sure that they do what we want them to do with the equipment we want them to do it with and then as they leave that they leave behind really a better place than it was before we have um a state forest that's ready to be um done you know i understand that's maybe out of our control but we have several single track trails that go through that forest and i've been out there and the trees are all marked and i can't imagine that those single tracks are going to be left and there's been an enormous amount of work for people to set up those trails for multi-purpose use. Um, okay, you had a lot of questions there. I'll try to go at a time. Um, as far as establishing town best management practices, one issue we were going to bring up in tonight's um, call and the Zoom to workshop is now you have a forest stewardship plan. The DCR sponsors um, annual grant um, funding to anyone that has a forest stewardship plan, and it's, you're eligible up to $20,000. And you may consider applying for one and using 
a certain percentage of it. You may do trail work, you may do signage, but use a certain percentage of it to craft your BMPs, to have them codified and in a mandate. So then the research could get done, you could do the outreach and get consensus, you could have your BMPs somewhere in town hall. So that's one idea for how to pay for it. Second idea, with DCR, you're right, they're going to sell that wood, and it's going to go to who they choose, who's paying good money, and you don't have a way to control the equipment. You, as a, as a resident of Massachusetts, you can call Adam Hines. You can, you can proactively have your voice out there so that DCR understands you're watching it. You can get a copy of their contract so that you understand what these guys actually agreed to do and you're going to understand where they have deviated. Do you know what I mean? You could be a proactive citizen. Um, whether DCR is going to change their business as usual or not, I can't know that. But as a community, you can, you, you can advocate for yourself. And, and with your newly gained knowledge from this process that Alex and I have presented to you, you're kind of getting a sense of how the game is played, and you're going to be more empowered to see um, different results. If that's helpful, and do you have anything to add, Alex? No, I think that that's really great, and I think you know it's 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 being you know that that potential sort of further grant work, you know, being able to get like we're talking about a number of legal issues that like you should have a lawyer opine on, you know, not so there, there's a lot of different stuff that would go in a lot of that would go into making that sausage. And if. In a, and in your application for that grant, you can say you're interested in being a participant in a carbon program. You want to make sure whatever minimal cutting is necessary for participation, that it's done in a way that's in alignment with the town's values. And I think and, and that grant that they put out each year, it's extremely easy to obtain. You just have to get in line, basically. It's a first come, first served. And I think it would be a way to address this because it, it came up from the very first meeting and it's repeatedly come up in any conversation I've had and the Zoom workshop, the survey, people feeling that what they have been guaranteed about soil and water quality function and protection has not been delivered through the course of a timber harvest project. So I, yeah, that's why we put it in there. It seems important to your community to pursue. Any more questions? We feel like we're taking too much of your time, but That's, thank you. So what is our next step now? You're going to have another public meeting? Correct. Yeah. You want to take this one, Alex? Yeah, next step is that uh, this week we'll put out the whole management plan. So we showed you three pages of uh 80-page document. <laughs> so, you know, that will take some digesting and we'll hopefully clarify some things and also I'm sure bring up more questions. So the idea there is that we, which is, you know, we were going to do the meeting earlier in August, but we weren't quite ready. And so we're going to publish the plans this week and then next in a week's time, have the next Zoom forum and have time to work through them, get more input from the town, answer lots of questions, um, and then begin to kind of finalize things and have final drafts, you know, in hopefully early September to middle of September ahead of our September 30th deadline. Can I make one more re tiny recommendation? But you're right, we're taking too long. But <laughs> so, so when we talked about things like crop tree release, uh, you know, you sort of you're saying you could you could do this uh, to try to protect the trees that you want to choose to protect, and or improve the vigor of the trees that you want to and protect. Protect sure. is a good word. Care care for, and you can define those trees in whatever value system you look at the forest with. But you've right. now heard a lot of input from the people of Conway. To me, it would be helpful if you tried to describe what you think you heard as the trees that ought to be protected. Or is this like, a decision we don't have to make for a year or five years? Or, you know, some of these things you said were going to be 2025. Is at that point we would make that decision? Um, no, I can call the data and come up with a definition of crop tree that I interpreted as um, representative of your community's 
also their understanding of crop trees. That's what you're asking us to do, correct? Well, to me, it would be helpful when I read the document if you were suggesting what you think Conway's choice of trees to be protected or encouraged would be. Yep. Okay. Instead of leaving yeah, we, it open. We definitely, we do that in the plan already. And I okay, think great. you'll probably like it because it focuses heavily on, you know, we, we start from values and what do people want? What people want is diversity and diversity varies by property. So what's diverse on the Fournier is not what's diverse on the town farm property. So, you know, in, in a lot of these cases, like the one white oak tree is really important. You should protect and value that and expand its ability to grow. Uh, you also, you know, so diversity of species is a variable thing. You know, quality of that tree, we heard a lot about wildlife and enjoying the property. So what trees are more valued by well, which wildlife and why? So that's in there. Um, and then also the, the sort of carbon accumulation and then you know the rates of accumulation then also the storage and mary pointed out really well that you know the the old trees on the forest are not necessarily uh the biggest nor the ones that are storing the most carbon great okay move on what, what's everybody think jan are you good john you good i'm good maybe they're not here or they're muted yeah okay Thank you very much, Alex, Mary. This was wonderful. Awesome. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, I, you, I, you know, it, it, maybe you. it makes for a long meeting. It's a long meeting for you, but it was really great. Come to the Zoom. <laughs> we will. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. We all knew that was going to take a while. Okay. Uh, so the next item on our agenda, letter of support for the Ashfield MassWorks grant for the Ashfield Dam. We talked about this last week. Phil, you were going to have a conversation. I did. Multiple conversations. Yeah. Um, with um, um, with uh, former selectman Ron Kohler, who is the official Ashfield Dam guy. <laughs> dam guy, okay. He's the dam guy. Um, and, and uh, I, I was impressed with his detailed level of knowledge and his understanding of the tie and bond engineering report and everything about it. And we had lengthy conversation. Um, <clears throat> we are going to have a follow up meeting. There's a lot that we both agreed on about things that we should be doing. Um, so we're going to have a follow up meeting to set the agenda. Um, um, you know, He's not a current select board member. He was for many years, I guess, but he is not now. But uh, um, he wants to bring Ashfield's emergency management person, and he wants me to show up with George Murphy. Um, but if I show up with you, Bob, then it would be uh, an open meeting thing. So um, <laughs> right. Um, but so so you, you're you're saying that you would propose that we sign this. We do, we do want to sign it, and then we do have more going on with Ashfield in the pipes. We've talked about there's various grants and uh, grant to come up with the uh, policy of, uh, proceed, pr of uh, procedures for the first responders for in case of a threatened dam failure. There's actual new equipment and new software that can be inserted in the dam that will give an, an, an automatic alert hmm. um, in case of, in, in a breach, and that's bit relatively inexpensive. Um, so there's things like that, um, that we have a lot of common ground on. So um, it is in our interest in them doing dam repairs right now. Yeah. But so uh, there's considerable doubt about whether or not mass works will ever fund this. But um, in the meantime, um, you know, I, I think last time I spoke I wasn't sure if I wanted to sign it now. I definitely am. So I did already, actually. I was at town hall earlier an hour ago and I did sign it. So, well, so I'm going to make a motion then that we officially vote to uh, sign the Ashfield Mass Works grant for the dam. Yes, second. And we both will say aye. Yes. So now you can say that you signed it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. New business. Uh, so we have, we, we received a copy of the town warrant. It's going to be the election warrant. The one page document says who's running. Or actually it just says what the positions are that are open. 
Um, you're, you have any, anybody have an issue with that? No, it needs to be signed right away, Bob. I understand. <laughs> so, I'm here in Conway today. Here well, I am in, in my Conway home. I'm going to come right down after the meeting and sign it. All right. So, so I'll make a motion that we sign that document. Second. And uh, we'll all say okay. aye. Yes. We'll approve the election warrant. Um, Ron, is Ron here for the highway department? I am. Hi, Ron. Yes, I am. So I Hi. believe that we would like to sign your MassWorks grant. Do you want to say a few words? Yes. Well, this is um, the third year of applying for this grant for Shelburne Falls Road. It's um, approximately 30,000 feet that we're looking to do from the town center here to just past Hart Road. Um, it's going to be a little over a million dollars. The grant will only be four million. So I've planned to use, I think it's 44,000 out of my operating budget to cover the additional cost of doing it. Um, the only thing that might change with that is maybe, because this grant won't happen until next year, um, I might ask for Chapter 90 money to cover that if I'm having issues with money to do the work. But um, for the most part, it's a small price to pay if we can get the road reclaimed and repaved. We'll be doing a bunch of drainage work and safety improvements to the road. So, the, so um, you mean this road is not going to paving and so. This road won't turn into the Buckland Road that leads down from the Conway border. I mean, it, it feels like we're you're hoping trying to that never happens. That. Yes. 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 That's what this is all about. <laughs> so so we I, don't really ever want a Conway Road to be that <laughs> that way. How, how common is it for you to be using your operations budget for road work? of this nature. That's what I use it for. Um, mostly I use my operating budget to take care of our gravel roads. And on it, I mean, we still do some with the pay, but I try to use chapter 90 money for paving projects. Um, just because there is not enough money to go around to do everything with my operating budget. Um, that's why we're behind on the paving projects um, because there's not enough chapter 90 money and I don't have enough money in my operating budget. But this project is a huge project. It's six miles long or just under six miles. Um, and if we, don't get this grant, then I'm going to have to start asking the town for money to fix that road out of town budget money or, you know, article, an article to ask the town for money to fix that. So I'm trying really hard to get this mass works grant to cover the cost of redoing that road. All right. So, but was this $44,000 from your budget, was that budgeted for it? Or d does that mean you're going to have to skimp on something else to en enable to do this? Like, well, what, what in my budget, it's used for working on the road. So it means that I'm just jockey things around a little bit to um, make this happen. But there's a lot of money that I would be spending on the road anyways. And this will help. I mean, it's more than I was hoping to spend on the road. But it's some of that money would have been spent on the road anyways, just in normal um, pothole money, uh, patching areas. Like there's a section that's really bad on by Newhall Road. I was going to have to do something with that out of my own budget. So it's kind of like using it, but for a better, better reason for the road. You know what I mean? Instead of yeah. using it to repair, to fix, you know, a, a small patch, I'm, I'm going to actually fix the road. All right. That makes sense. That makes oh. sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
So I'm going to make a motion that we uh, sign Ron's uh, uh, letter of support of his grant proposal for the Shelburne Falls Road. Well, uh, I'll second that. And just a question to Tom, was that on the table an hour ago? Yeah. Uh, did I sign it? <laughs> uh yes yes there you go okay so i'm so oh, yeah. Uh, yeah on the real physical table sorry i thought you meant the more metaphorical table oh no uh, no no the real table so we have a motion and it's seconded and i take it that you're saying i because you already signed it and yes. and i'm going to say i so i will be down to sign it so ron thank you very much thank you ron I think thank you okay I think there's something else yep. for him. There's, there's something else for him, though. Uh, well, we'll there see. Is. I don't know. Propose new job description. It's on the it's on the revi new revised uh, agenda that just came hot off the presses like shortly before the meeting. I am looking. And it says propose new job. Yeah, maybe there's a newer one. It says propose new job description, mechanic slash laborer. Like, Tom, is that on the current agenda? How can this not be? I have too many agendas. Tom, are you there? Oh, sorry. I've had my mute on. Yes. Um, that was an old agenda. Sorry. There have been a lot of versions of this agenda flying around, uh, but it was the most complete. Uh, I will be going over that uh, during my update because, it, yeah, it's, it's an internal change that doesn't cost any money. So um, it, it's more informative. But, yeah, um, we're, we're, we're trying to create a better department here. So we'll get so there. So that, that's what that's about. Yeah. So, so Ron, I'm sure you'll stay on just to hear that, but anyway, and maybe not. Uh, so Jan, you're up next. Uh, Hi. Uh, approval yeah, so, of the financial policy. Yep. Tom uh, has been going through our our Maya insurance policy, and one of their requirements is that uh, we develop a cyber policy in terms of uh, banking. So I've made a little addendum to our financial policies and hopefully you've gotten a chance to take a look at it and could ask me any questions, but it, it basically means that, um, you know, any changes to transactions such as wire transactions or ACH, which are, you know, direct bank to bank transactions, like automated clearinghouse, um, anyway, any changes to those need to be followed up by a phone call. You know, we recently, or I recently fell victim to a, a um, payroll request for a direct deposit that went to the wrong place. Luckily, it was pretty small, but so those policies need to go in place. And um, so it's a nice little improvement to our financial policies book. Small thing. Tom sent it to us, and I will say that I did try to read it, but whew. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I kept it as short as I could. I, I'm glad I have great confidence in you. <laughs> so, so what do you think, Phil? Did you read it? I, I started to read it, and I skimmed through it. I did not have any coffee with me, however, so I couldn't complete my assignment. But um, It's very exciting, isn't it? It basically uh, says that I need to follow up with a phone call for any, any electronic changes that happen whether it's for a vendor yeah, or an employee. The, I, I can the, see highlighted, the, the highlighted parts of that were the only parts that are up for discussion now. It's not the whole Correct. document. Okay. It's about four points. Uh, well, about six, actually. There's two, and then they're followed the next page by about four. Yeah, it, on it's, page it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It, it, it only has to do with electronic transfers. Actually, that reader's guide that you just supplied does, does simplify things very much. 
So I'm going to make a motion that we approve these changes to the financial policy that Jan just described. A uh, second. Let's so that's up. great. Thank you very much. Um, I will need your signature. So we'll leave the signature page out on the table for you. You have that, Tom? On the table. Uh, yes. And, and, and Bob, we just need your signature. Phil, there's no reason uh, for you to have to come in. All right. Great. See ya. I'll Thank do you. That, do that tonight. So items not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Do we have any of those? I do not. Nor I. Town administrator update, Tom. Yes. Um, uh, well, there's a, there's a fair amount on here, actually. Um, uh, but, um, oh, hang on one second. Uh, there we go. Um, for committees and boards, uh, the assessors received approval from the Bureau of Accounts at the Department of Revenue to issue preliminary tax bills. Our next step is to file a pro forma recap for the FY21 budget, uh, although we will be limited to charging 50% of people's FY20 taxes. I'm working with the assessor on that, especially our revenue estimates as having those estimates be lower than the actual revenues while still reasonable will be important. The recent announcement of level funded Chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid accounts is very helpful in this regard. Um, and here's the uh, job description there. Uh, this is an item really under both the personnel committee and the highway department. The uh, personnel committee reviewed a proposed job description from the highway department. There's currently an open position in the highway department and Ron would prefer a mechanic laborer, uh, which due to staff changes, he, uh, he has the money to fund. He, he's not asking for any additional money for this. Um, the personnel committee has reviewed and approved the job description. So we're planning to post the position this week and fill the vacancy in the highway crew as soon as possible. Um, it, it's hard to get people in this position, so we don't know exactly when that will happen, but of course we want it to happen as soon as possible. So is this something the board um, has to approve? Or, I mean, it sounds like it's not. No, no, this is, this is and that's why it's not on the agenda. No, it, um, I originally put it on because I thought there would be budgetary implications, but um, there aren't, so that's really good. Um, it's just a, a reshuffling, and he's he's renaming a position. Um, and with any luck, we will get somebody who can do more work on the trucks in house. One, one of the big difficulties he's had, uh, especially with the with the trucks that he's phasing out, is that the electronics are not reliable. Um, and also, there 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 are bigger bigger jobs that he has to do sometimes and you know every day that his truck is in the shop is a day it can't be used and that really matters in the winter um so we're uh we're hoping to get somebody on board soon and be able to keep the trucks out of the shop as much as possible um jennifer mullins is now co-chair of the planning board along with beth gershman just uh, thought you'd like to know that. Uh, Conway Currents, our newsletter, will have a giveaway section starting with the next issue as the take it or leave it station is not open at the transfer station. Uh, in departmental news, the big news is that I have received a letter of resignation from Lisa Turowski. I've posted the position on the website and out front Please let, uh, please tell anyone you think might be a good fit to apply. I'm advertising locally first, but we'll put an ad in the recorder if I think I need a larger pool of applicants. And the position will remain open until filled. Lisa, do you have a twin sister? Uh, not that I know of one. <laughs> no, I, I think don't. he wants her to no. apply. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, I'll I'll tell her. Okay. I'll have her apply directly <laughs> to you. 
the local tax situation uh, is starting to sh take shape. It looks now that for FY 2020, we're down a net of about 28,549 from what we would normally expect. This is, of course, much less than the pessimistic figures considered earlier, but does not include any indication of FY21 taxes. Just so you know, I'm keeping an eye on that. Great. Uh, there has been an uptick in requests for information about community host agreements, especially for retail operations, but also for cultivation and manufacturing, meaning in Conway. Uh, I have received three requests within the last two weeks, all from outside Massachusetts. Well, one of them did have a Massachusetts office, um, but the first person who called was from Georgia, I believe. I followed up on Chief Baker's concern about callouts for town employees and can report that it is currently Highway Department uh, policy that employees must get permission from their supervisor before responding to calls, whether in town or out of town. Uh, it is also the policy of Wimet Plumbing and Heating, another employer of a first responder, that permission must be obtained before leaving on a call. It is OESCO's protocol for employ the, that employees are, inspect, are expected to tell either their manager preferred or another employee if they leave for a call or are out on a call and will be late for work. So those are uh, three of the uh, ways that that's being managed now. Two of them are permission must be obtained before leaving on a call. Uh, and that's all I have right now. Thank you. Uh, any mail? Yes, I sent you something earlier that was for mail. Did you uh, did you get that? Uh, I probably did. And and uh, I got another piece of mail about the South River, um, uh, just just recently. And I will um, I will for I, I have forwarded that to both Ron because it has a, a, a highway issue and to Ken because it has a parking issue, and I've asked for their um, input on those issues um, before bringing it back to you. That was from uh, somebody uh, who has been speaking with Bob Van Gelder and uh, wanted to add some information. So I'll have, I'll have some more on that, I hope, next time. So I remember reading what the mail was you sent me, but now I... I don't remember. Yeah, that was, uh, let's that see. There's minutes, payroll, presentation, night, landscaping. Oh, uh, Was it about the solar? There was there was uh, the email um, where someone had uh, complained about the solar installation and it had been resolved um, very uh, very well. So that's good. And, and NextAmp is um, keeping uh, the writer informed as well as um, the uh, conservation commission. So that that's good. Yeah. Next camp described their process as being they're all done cutting trees, they're cleaning up. Um, they're getting a lot of the heavy equipment, uh, he, like panels and things delivered. And so soon even the, the really noisy trucks aren't going to be aren't going to be on the that steep driveway anymore. So yeah, was, and, and it sounded like the I mean, hopefully, Jerry, the the the, the neighbor is a little happier. There was no letter from Jerry at the end that said, I feel a lot better. Oh, right. And, and the other one was from, uh, was from Comcast. 
uh, about um, the Internet Essentials Program Enhancement, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. where um, they, they, they enable participating organizations to sponsor or pay for service on behalf of families um, so the town could sponsor low-income families for um, a high-speed Internet connection, the option to purchase a low-cost computer, and access to free digital skills training. Uh, and, and I was thinking that the town could do that through uh, uh, the uh, trust fund uh, if we thought that there were low-income people in Conway who needed uh, Internet help, especially, uh, you know, with the pandemic and having kids working from home. I haven't heard um, of any, I haven't heard, but I wouldn't really expect to have heard from uh, problems from students who are having trouble accessing the internet from home, uh, especially due to low income issues. And I don't know, maybe Phil has something to add to that, but it was an offer that we got from Comcast that I thought uh, the select board should know about. Yeah, due, due to the Corona situation, they've expanded their Internet Essentials program. And I think that I think Conway would have to become a sponsor. I don't know what's involved in that. I wrote to Eileen uh, uh, Leahy and asked her. Yeah, sorry, Bob, you broke up on my machine when you said Conway would have to become something. A sponsor. A sponsor. You know, oh yeah. I, I think the town would become a a, a, um, a, 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 we would have to sponsor it, and I don't know if that would cost any money, or how we signed up. Uh, yes, yes, it, it would be paying for services. That uh, that's how I read the email. So that's why I thought, you know, if we knew of something, we could use the trust fund money to do that. But I hadn't heard of anything, so I thought I, we should we should bring it up and at least talk about it here. This would be a great thing to put on the website, you know, about this program. Well, uh, if if we decided to go forward to do it, well, uh, I, I wonder I wonder whether the whether the the superintendent knows really or 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 is utilizing this because the school the Union Thirty Eight that throughout the four school did had. It's a small number of families that either technically don't have the ability, um, the your hardware-wise don't have the ability, um, or else uh, you know, financially don't have the ability to have Wi-Fi. Um, and they did uh, they did uh, work out arrangements for all of the families, like individually. I think with, with um, to. Portable Wi-Fi, portable Wi-Fi hotspot technology that's um, relatively inexpensive, and there's a small number of those, and um, and also they've made arrangements, I think, with some people to come in to use the school facility sometimes too. So I don't, um, but I, I don't, I don't know if the Comcast thing. I, I remember this coming up, but I don't know. I, I don't recall anybody ever mentioning the Comcast thing. I will. Uh, well, I, I'll I'll be happy to write to write Darius and ask him if he if he uh, thinks it would be a useful program for the town to enter into. Yeah, he may know about it. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Any announcements? All right. Phil, any announcements? I have none. No. The my announcement is that 2020 will have to end at some point. <laughs> I don't know. It's, Thank you know. for that reminder. <laughs> like a Bill Murray movie. Okay, our next uh, current uh, concerns of the selectmen. Bill, do you have any concerns? No. Well, no. Uh, oh, go ahead. What? No, no. The yeah. Celtics blame. <laughs> our next meeting is uh, August 31, two weeks from now, 6 p.m. by Zoom. Other than that, I would make a motion that we adjourn. I think we are going to be meeting with Deerfield before then. No, we don't have a formal agenda yet, but I think, um, but it's going to be their meeting that we're going to be dialing into. 
yeah, we should have a good agenda. And um, I'm a little nervous over talking to them about things that we haven't talked about as a committee. Yeah, but that's, well, that's one way we get to talk about it as a committee. <laughs> uh, well, we can certainly talk about it to get some input, but. Yeah, yeah, just, it's just a heads up. We have to start somewhere. Yeah, okay. Um, but talk, what, what, what is it that you have? What, do you have any questions about anything? This is the time. Concerns of the select board. Pre. You asking Tom? No, you. you. You me. No, I said I have no concerns. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Okay. So I made a motion. We adjourn. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, I second. Then I'll say aye. So let's consider that adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob.